Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Simon Whistler. Hi Simon! Hey Jo, how are you? I'm good and I'm very excited to have Simon on the show. So just as a little introduction to those people who haven't heard Simon before, uh, Simon is an author and voice talent and audiobook narrator as well as a podcaster running the very popular rocking self-publishing podcast. So you may well have heard Simon before and his new book is Audiobooks for Indies, Unlock the Potential of Your Book, which is brilliant and we're talking all about that today. So Simon, uh, tell us a bit more about you and your background, especially how you developed your very plummy English <laughs> accent. Over education, I guess, that I haven't put to good use becoming a podcaster, I suppose. <laughs> um, I started off with my podcast and in that introduction you made me sound like I do a lot and I'm like, wow, I really do all of those things. I'm a podcaster <laughs> and very recent author. Um, I started Rocking Self Publishing, I guess, a year and a bit ago. Spoken to some 70 authors. Uh, there's a new interview every every Thursday. You've been on once and you're coming on again very shortly, which I'm looking forward to. Um, so yeah, lots of education. I developed a plummy accent, apparently. Um, and then, so before I was doing the podcast, I was, as you mentioned, a, a voiceover uh, artist, actor, narrator, it's its uh, hard to put a job title on that, it's always difficult at parties. Um, but I was narrating uh, a bunch of books and doing a lot of kind of freelance for adverts, for video tutorials and stuff. And then I was working with indie authors a lot on books and thought, I should interview some of these guys. And one thing led to another. I never really expected. I was listening to your show way before I did mine. I was saying before we started on the call, I'm like a little bit nervous. I've done like 70 interviews talking to these big time authors. And I'm still like get the butterflies talking to Joanna Penn, who I've spoken to several times before. But uh, yeah, and so the podcast kind of took off and went from there. And now here we are heading towards episode 70. I know. Well, that, you know, that is amazing. And you have a, you know, particular format. You do interviews as well, which, you know, I like. And yours are kind of, you know, go into the in-depth of, of indies, which is, is brilliant. But before that, you know, what, what did you do at, at college? Did you, were you uh, at college at all? Yeah, totally unrelated. I um, did three years um, undergrad business. And then I went, I, I did a year's traveling, which probably caused problems later in life. I'll explain. Um, I went back and I was like, I'm going to do the legal conversion course, which is like, oh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I went back and I spent a lot of money doing that or I'm um, getting in debt to my parents. I'm um, doing that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then it was kind of, that was around 2009, 2010. Uh, economy wasn't so brilliant upon graduating. Uh, some of the firms where I did internships and open days basically weren't hiring as many people as they used to. Um, and I was like, okay, what shall I do? And I mentioned I did that years traveling abroad between um, the business, finishing the business degree. And I was like, I could do some more traveling, but combining that with work, that would be a good idea. So I, uh, there's a fantastic student organization called ISEC, um, which organize um, like internships for people who are uh, students and people who've recently graduated. So I went and spent like a year in Sri Lanka which was amazing. And I was working for six months through this internship. And then I started kind of freelancing when I was there. And it was kind of one of these, I guess, you know, the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss. And it was kind of like, huh, you can make pretty good money working very little and spend it in your rupees. And it was, I, I read this book and I was like, this is awesome. And so I spent six months there. Um, I met my girlfriend there who is, uh, she was with the, through the same organization and she is Czech and then after that I moved to Czech and I've well I've been here ever since sort of I've done traveling we spent some time in Mexico as well and um yeah just uh doing a bit of that doing a bit of podcasting doing a few audiobooks uh, yeah that's my that's my story no I love that and um yeah you're in Prague along with David Gochran and yeah. um I know Derek Murphy's coming over as well he's my book cover designer I met Derek in Bangkok like two weeks ago 
<laughs> and we were like hanging out. We went to this co-working space together and he was talking about all of this stuff. And we, you came up, of course, because I know you, he does your book covers, which was crazy. I and know. It's, it's such a small world. I, I said to my husband, I think we should move to Prague. It seems to be like it's becoming this kind of hub. <laughs> David and I are going to make it a hub. It's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, although David's now saying he wants to go to, back to South America and all this stuff. But what's so interesting, you know, I, I, I bring up your background because the business aspect comes through to me. It, you know, you, you do have a business now, which, you know, you've had a proper education in, unlike me, my degrees in theology. So, um, but that comes through, I think, in everything you do. I think, it, I think it does, although in a business degree, they do teach you you know, with the expectation that you graduate, uh, graduate and go work for Deloitte or something yeah. and then go up the ranks. And then, you know, at that point, they actually teach you how to do business. Whereas at university, they're more like, have you read Hofstetter's books on something <laughs> or other? Or there's something about an onion. I was apparently not a very good student. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I think it's almost even a language, like even thinking mm. about income which I, I think a lot of authors even you know, well but I, it's it's come to me lately that a lot of authors don't even think about money when they start writing books and the mindset shift from writing a book to running a business as an author is, is quite different but let's get into this your book because you've actually subtitled it unlock the potential of your book which I assume is a business aspect it was actually very much a, a subtitle that I put out to send out with my advanced reader copies. And I was like, I'm going to think about this when I think about my product oh. description. No, no, no. But it's, it, <laughs> What is the real yeah. subtitle? <laughs> I'm, I'm still working on it, but I liked the fact that you read it and you reading it made it sound so professional. I was like, wow, no, unlock the potential of your book. It actually sounds better when Joe says it. Um, <laughs> so maybe I'll stick with it. Um, but basically, you know, the idea is that you, you know, there are so many rights associated with a book more than just the digital or the print rights. Mm -hmm. And not all authors are exploiting these. And I think that does come down to uh, not a lack of business now, but just, you know, focusing on some stuff. And this is, I'm all for people focusing on writing and, you know, write the next book, just write the next book. But some things are easy and audiobooks are relatively easy they are relatively inexpensive to produce which i'm sure we'll get into and, and oftentimes can be done for no upfront cost as as i'm sure we'll get into but you know this is they are there is potential there to be unlocked at least mm. yeah so let's you know go into that a bit more you know because i agree with you i think once you you know a lot of people start with ebooks these days they do then they do print and then it's like yes now we should do audiobooks so why is audio such uh, an expanding market right now i think as amazon are behind it you know? <laughs> Where Amazon are putting a lot of money into it. You have so many things like they're putting the stipends on books, which is where a narrator gets paid up front as well. They're expanding into international markets. They launched in the UK earlier this year after a few, a few years in the US. And I think when Amazon gets behind something and they set their sights on like, we're going to make audio a thing, they're going to make audio a thing. And there's also the growth of um, it just simply because of the advancing digital technology. Now everyone has a smartphone in their pocket. You can, with 3G, I mean, you could be listening to the audiobook and I'll be yeah. out and about on a run and it'll be like, oh, um, you haven't got the next chapter. And I'm like, well, that's okay. Do you, it says, do you want to stream it via 3G? And I'm like, yes. So anywhere you are, there's like, it's completely on demand. There's no... You know, there's no holdups. I mean, what was it, 10, 15 years ago, you'd have like the 30 CD box sets and it tapes. would be like, or even before that, tapes, I guess. I don't think they did it on records. But uh, <laughs> I mean, this technology has really made this a viable thing. There's no need to, to print up because when you looked at books, books were fine, but audiobooks were 30 CDs, which is expensive. Mm. And so I think this is something, you know, this is something that will be changed as much as has been changed as much as, as books. Mm. And the other thing I think is from from a, a standing out perspective, I really feel that, you know, uh, there's so much text in the world, actually having audio can help you stand out of it. Because if you look at the number of books on Audible compared to the number of books on Amazon.com, I mean, it's not comparable. Yeah, and it's, and there's also people who only want to listen to audio. I was, I'm surprised at this myself. I prefer reading even though despite my profession I kind of would rather just sit down and read a good book but there are people who I they just prefer listening they'll mm. 
you know, if they have a long commute, they listen to books in their car and then they get home from like a long day at work and they, they go to sleep or, you know, they now they can, can just continue with that book on their smartphone and listen. So, mm. yeah, there's the whole market of those people as well. Oh, and the ageing demographic with people. <laughs> yes, who are losing their sight and don't want their bifocals or something. <laughs> there's another one. Well, and I also actually, I have a friend who's blind and that is how he reads. And what was really, obviously that is how he reads. And, and that, you know, what was so funny is when he said to me, so can I get your audio book? And I was like, well, you know, you can. And we were talking about it. And of course, up until recently, the main market for audio books has been literary fiction where publishers have paid for the narration. There's been very little genre fiction in audiobooks because really publishers yeah. haven't paid for it and and I, I've said to him look you know and actually what what's interesting to me is how things will change because he's used to having famous actors read books yeah but now things are changing and you know do, do you find because you read a lot of them do people look for the next Simon Whistler um I I have to say I fall down on the side of it's much more about the book than it is about the narrator I think while there is, you know, there are some big names in narration and these will attract people to the book. For the most part, people are interested in the book and they can let a lot slide with narration. I think a good narrator can really enhance a book, mm. but I don't, I, I typically don't think people go out there and look for the next great narrator. And I think that's a good thing for authors generally, mm. because I think it means there's more, you know, there's a large pool of narrators who aren't charging insane rates. You know, there's this kind of a once you're over $200 per finished hour, so that's kind of per delivered hour, you're getting a really good result. And there's, there's just a lot of narrators who are doing fantastic books. Mm. Okay, so let's talk about, um, I mean, ACX being the biggest thing. Just briefly explain ACX for anybody who might not have heard of it yet. All right, so ACX is the Audiobook Creation Exchange. It's an Amazon company, and it basically allows an author, particularly indie authors, to go there claim the rights to their book. So they log in with their Amazon account and they say, hey, I'm the author of um, How to Market a Book. And then you can open up auditions and you could say, hey, narrators, I want to make this book. I'm willing to pay this amount of money or, which is, this is important, I will split the money with you. So for seven years. So you kind of share the rights, the audio rights with the narrator for seven years. They go away, they narrate the book. There's a little bit of intricacy there. There's kind of like an audition process. There's a sample process. There's a proof um, process by the author and ACX. And then eventually you have this book produced and it goes on sale. And ACX allow you to reach, there's, again, it branches here again. There's two separate options. Um, I feel sometimes, I think I put a diagram in my book for this, but it's like, then you go down an exclusive path or a non-exclusive path. If you go exclusive with ACX, they will distribute through Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, which are the biggest markets. And then the author and the narrator will split 40%. Or if the author's just paid the narrator up front, they take all of that 40%. And then if you go uh, non-exclusive, so that means the books do go out on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, which kind of partner with ACX. But then you also have the rights to kind of sell direct if you want to, or get it made up into CDs and send it out or se and sell it to your fans and all of this stuff. Um, but then you do take a hit and you will only get 25%. So there's a 15% drop off if you decide to, you know, retain, uh, not, not give uh, ACX exclusive rights. Did I, I know there's a few branches there. Did mm. that, did that lay it out? Clearly? Yeah, no. And I think if people are confused, all you need to do is log on to ACX.com mm. and it is actually much easier than, you know, it's like <laughs> trying to explain KDP or, you know, any kind of self-publishing. If you just go to the website, it's easy to just do it. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the important thing to, to get across. It is, it is pretty easy. Yeah. It <laughs> like, is and so they have easy. diagrams as well. <laughs> they do. And I mean, personally, I've chosen to go um, royalty split uh, with narrators, which means I've paid nothing. Um, and also exclusive with ACX, which is essentially the easiest option and no money down. It's kind of your um, minimum investment, maximum return, because I mean, there are reasons you might want to go non-exclusive, but typically for most authors, the easiest, most profitable route is to go exclusive. Yeah. Now, in, and obviously in terms of, I have put a few books up in terms of my translations that haven't been picked up by a narrator yet, which I don't uh -huh. think that's surprising, you know, like a Spanish book, because at the moment it's only open to US, UK, anyone else? 
That's it right now. Uh, which, I, I've um, got Canadians emailing me saying, hey, Simon, in the book, anything about Canada? And the Australians in their accents. Not oh, in the US, they will. But... Germany. I mean, I'm, I'm really hoping that, you know, we'll get mm. some, we'll get Germany because apparently the market for audiobooks in Germany is bigger than for ebooks. Really? Yeah, I read wow, that. I did not know that. Yeah, I read that and just went, wow, I really hope they open up. And I actually have got a German narrator who is in America to, who's going to do Pentecost in German next year. Okay. Um, but it, if that opens up, I think, I mean, one would expect that because it took them a year to open up in Britain, it was a year or two years, I think. So we would hope that they'll make enough money that they'll want to expand, right? Well, you could absolutely just hire, if you, you wouldn't be able to do royalty split with them, but you could hire a German narrator and pay them up front and then load the book in yourself through ACX UK because then, you know, the German citizen wouldn't need to be a part of the program. Mm. Just for anyone listening who isn't in the US or the UK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. But um, in terms of those people who aren't, um, what, what are their options? There are a few and they are difficult because... I mean, I was in this situation a year ago and I went through all of this trouble. I looked at uh, setting up a US company. I looked at a company called eBookit. There's a couple of others. And basically, and then they came to the UK and I was like, awesome. All of this trouble is just, I mean, it, it was trouble and it was research and it was a lot of effort to see how I could make this work. And then I was like, fantastic. Let's just do it in the UK. So I don't know. It's a really hard call because I don't know when they're going to launch in these different countries and territories. I don't. I would wait. This is the thing. Um, the see. company, mm. wait and see. Because yeah. No, and it's a good point because I didn't wait. I signed with a small press in the US and did three. Yeah. let them do three books for me and I lost basically half my royalties because of that. So, yeah, it's difficult. But um, let's, let's talk about some more things. Um, so first up, what is, um, you know, fiction and non-fiction? Uh, you know, my feeling as a listener, I don't listen to fiction audiobooks. I do listen to non-fiction and I love to hear the author, the author reading because like I norm like Stephen Pressfield, you know, I want to hear his voice reading. So um, what do you feel about non-fiction for authors? If you can narrate it yourself, I'm, I'm in exactly the same boat. Uh, in the fact, I don't listen to much fiction audiobooks. I do listen to a lot of nonfiction. I do like them read by the authors. Mm. Sometimes if I don't, you know, if I don't think about it and you don't, you know, you don't know what that author sounds like, that's cool. But um, if you can narrate it yourself, you, you should seriously consider it. And there are you know, it's not this crazy hurdle where you have to go into a studio and pay some guy with a big board with 600 little dials and screens and those soundproof glass windows that you see in the movies. Uh, I'm not using it right now, but I can swing in this mic and anyone who listens to my podcast, this is where I do my books. I have this, oh, of course, you've got an audio show as well, but I'm swinging in like a, a <laughs> podcast microphone with a pop filter in front of it. This thing's uh, $200. Um, this behind here is, uh, I'm pointing to like the, the big curtain that hangs behind me because that stops the echoes going around the room. And then other than that, I'm sitting at my desk and this is all together and this is a good setup and you don't need something as complicated as I have. I think $150 on microphone, software's free, you can use a program called Audacity and just see how you're going, um, see, you know, see how easy it is to do. But before that, use a, have a read of your book, sit down and read it out loud and see how you feel reading it. Because if you hesitate and if you're like, oh, I'm not very good at this, it's a, you know, it is, there's definitely a learning curve there. But if you, mm -hmm. if you're a speaker, if you are, have kind of, I, I know you've recently narrated your own book, right? Um, How to Market a Book. No, I did, I did Business for Authors. Business for Authors, sorry, yeah. that's right. No, uh, for, for the launch, but what's so interesting, and I, so I did it myself, but because I, is it, is it called Unabridged when you make up extra yeah, yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, where you read it, the full thing. You read the full thing and then you add a, add a bit, add extra bits. I don't think that has a word. I would oh. call that breaking whisper sync. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's the thing. So what I thought was, I'll, I'll to give people a bonus, I'll read the chapter and then I'll add extra stuff and that will make people happy. And then, of course, you're saying this stuff, I'm thinking, oh dear, now I, you know, we should explain. Whisper sync means that people can just stop on the ebook and it, it, it ma has to match like 99% or something with the text, right? Yeah, the reason I say breaking is because 
again, people, this is, this is a debate going on about whether it's good or bad for the amount of money you make, but because you can take a WhisperSync uh, a ebook you've bought, you can get the audio version for $2, which is significantly cheaper than a normal audiobook, so it can hurt your audiobook sales. Ah, so almost you don't want WhisperSync. Uh, a, it's debatable. Some people say it's good. Some people say, mm. you know, the numbers are all up, you know, because of quantity. Yeah. But some people are like, it's not been good for me. Yeah, that's, that isn't actually really interesting. I have noticed, and we should, I mean, we're jumping around a bit here, but... Yeah, um, sorry. It's, no, uh, it's fine. It's my, my fault. But um, <laughs> the you can't set your own price. No. Nah. Which is no. really weird, right? This... If you want to jump around again, I mean, the whole marketing thing and not having price control as an indie is like, I get emails about this all the time. People are like, so um, when I put my audiobook out, I'm thinking of like lowering the price and like, and then I'm going to do the rest in the series and I'll take the hit on the first book. I'm like, no, you won't <laughs> because you can't control the price. Yeah. And they kind and it's almost, I don't even know how they work it out. Do you know how they work out the price? I identified price points in my book just for the US store. So that would be exclusive through Audible, iTunes, and Amazon. I think I came out with 12 different price points because they have a subscription model. Yeah. So you pay your, the standard thing is you pay your $15 a month and you get one credit, which is one audiobook. But you can also like, you can have a free trial month, you can get three months discounted, you can buy 24 months up front and very quickly. And of course you can buy books if you're not a member. So there's a a la carte price. And there's just so many price points. I tried to work it out and I came up with like an average figure. And then I looked at what a lot of different authors were making off their books and then kind of came up and it was like, okay, but it's, it's really, I know it sounds confusing because it really is confusing. (laughs) It's definitely confusing. All I would say again is, um, don't worry about it. Yeah. There's nothing you could do about it. You kind of have to, don't worry about it. And I've got, uh, seven, I think now. Um, but it's interesting. Let's go back to the fiction, nonfiction thing. Mm. So, (laughs) so, um, well, this is just a personal question then. So I have this business for authors that I've narrated and it's in uh, six hours of MP3 files. But what scares me about the ACX um, platform is the sound quality page, which I read and go, I just don't understand this. So if I, I mean, is there a way of, of if I uploaded those, do they just reject them if they don't work or? I'll tell you what's wrong. Yeah. But they'll be like, the sound floor on track six is a little high or low or right. uh, honestly I'm a bit confused by it and I know a bit about audio <laughs> okay so because um, it, it no, reads like some kind of fo- foreign language it's aimed at technical people and I understand that page and because I've had to get books through that and now I'm like oh okay so you just need to do this and do yeah. this and I'm thinking I haven't done it yet but to complement the book I'm going to put together a video on YouTube which will just take people through and be like step one where it says You know, you need um, no more peaks above minus 3 dB for people who are like, what the, just minus 3 dB mean? I'll just be like, it just means this in audacity. So just follow this and you'll be fine. Yeah, I think think they should do this, but I mean, I'll make it as like a a free plugin video for the book. Wow, that's great. And I should say that your website now at rockingselfpublishing.com, right? Um, Yeah. does have a whole load of, I send people to your build a website, author website special. You have all kinds of stuff now, which is great. You're really providing a lot of um, more technical help, I would say. So that video would be amazing. I would love that. Um, because I do feel like I've resisted loading up, like how to market a book. It's 75,000 blooming words. And I know to read it myself is a big job, but I've just updated it. And I feel like I really want to read it. Um, anyway, so that's interesting. Let's get back to fiction. I don't read my fiction. I don't want to mainly because of the different voices, right? (laughs) So let's just explain that for anyone who doesn't kind of know. So when somebody, when a narrator reads a fiction book, explain that. So yeah, like you say, um, you've kind of got the the narrative. So it'll be, you know, um, it was a dark and stormy night or whatever. But then when the captain of the ship speaks, you kind of want to hear it in a pirate voice, right? Uh, at least most listeners will be like, well, I want Captain Jack to sound like a pirate. And I want the, you know, the women to sound like women, even if it's a male narrator and all of this stuff. So yeah, I, my, as I say in the book and my general advice to authors with fiction books is 
Unlike nonfiction, where sometimes the narrator likes the author to read the book, 99% of cases, and I don't know if you know Nathan Lowell, who yeah, yeah. did yeah. his podio books, you know, he is an exception to the rule. Generally, I would recommend against doing your own fiction books, um, mm. unless you are, you know, feeling particularly theatrical. Um, and even if you are, record some and then make sure your friends also agree that you are feeling theatrical because <laughs> um, it's it's a much harder job to narrate a fiction book than it is a nonfiction, as mm. you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. I totally agree with you. So then how do authors find the best narrators for their work? This is kind of in the ACX process. So when you, you've claimed your rights, and then I mentioned, you know, there was the audition process. So you'll put your book up, you'll say, I'm looking for, oh, you can choose like this, a huge array of accents. Even in America, they're like Southern, Midwestern, Northeastern, Californian, or there's a, there's a lot. And then you've kind of got Irish, Welsh, Australia, and you tick these different boxes anyway. And you, so you say like, I want like um, Midwest, US accent, uh, female narrator, um, age range, and there's a bunch of criteria. So you're not going to be listening to a lot of auditions from, you know, that are just not going to be it. Because if you've got like a romance book, typically read by women. Um, <laughs> so you won't, you know, you'll select female and then male narrators just won't audition. So you won't be like overwhelmed. And then you know, you'll put that out and assuming you're offering a fair rate or your book is reasonably successful and you're offering a, a royalty split, you'll get auditions come in and then they'll kind of be, it depends on how, how long the audition script you upload is, but I'd recommend, you know, aim for, aim for 10 minutes and then listen to, listen to those auditions. And then you can, it, it, this is the, one of the things I hear most people have most joy with. They kind of get all these auditions and this is kind of before you've even, they've even started and raising the book and you're like, it's so cool. I've got all these different people reading my words that I wrote and I'm going to pick, it's kind of like, it's not as cool as like the movie producer knocking on the door, but it's, it's kind of got that same feeling I hear. Um, <laughs> but sorry, go on. No, no. Well, I was going to say you as a, a narrator, how do you pick projects? Ooh. Um, I think as we discussed, you know, there's definitely the business side comes first in this situation because it's not like writing a book, but narrating a book is, is a good chunk of work. If the book's 10 hours long, an experienced narrator, you're looking at 30 or 40 hours of work. And so, you know, it's got to have a reasonable rate if it's per finished hour. So I would look at stuff above $200 per finished hour. Or I actually prefer doing a royalty split on a successful book. And then that's a lot harder to quantify because you can't, unless the author is saying, I sold X number of books last month. You, but you can, you know, you can look at the sales, the historical sales rank, you can see the reviews, you can, and you can even look at the kind of vanity metrics. How many people are following this person on Twitter? What are they doing to promote their books? Um, and kind of get a feel about whether this is going to, to pay off. And I... I think this is the business thing again. I look for long-term payoffs. So you get a paycheck every month from ACX if you're on if your book is up there or you're doing a royalty share. And seven months over twelve year, uh, seven years with twelve months in the year, that's a lot of smaller paychecks, but over a long time. So the return can be higher if you're if you're willing to mm. to accept that, which um, I generally am. Yeah, and, and then so authors with series would be more attractive to you because the more books there are, the more likely people are to buy them? Or Yes, but there's also a risk that if you do the first book in the series and it doesn't sell particularly well, then you've got this kind of situation with the author where you're like, so, um, yeah. they're like, will you do my second book on royalty split? And you're like, we sold four copies last month or something. <laughs> And so that becomes difficult. But again, yeah. you've got to be a professional. You've got to be a business person. And no, it is it is a a difficult thing. And you know, I realise that because of my platform, that it's been quite easy for me to get people to do royalty split. But all I would say is, uh, I know authors who have paid for that, and they've been happy too. So you know, I think that you can go either way um but i also wanted to ask about how what's the best way that people work with narrators because you know i realized that some i realized more and more that a narrator a translator um you know adapting film rights 
the person is not a passive receptacle for what you've <laughs> created. They almost they become it's an interpretation, right? So you don't yeah. so you don't want to be a nightmare. So what what are your tips for authors in working with narrators? All right, there's it's it's really hard because you've got to hit this balance between being like crazy over because some some authors will be like I want to hear like every chapter once you've done this and I'll listen to it and they'll pick through every little piece and it's like that is hard work for an eraser I mean I can't say don't do it because it's your book and you've got to have the result you want but that is that is difficult and yeah so the way I like it from the narrator's perspective is when you put the book on ACX you get this 15 minutes so you've selected your narrator you've said let's work together you sign your digital contracts or you click the buttons or whatever they do and then you say you know 15 minutes of the book gets produced so i'll go away and i'll read 15 minutes from the start and then you as the author would listen to it and say like it's good go ahead and make the rest of the book or and which i prefer is really be picky on that 15 minutes really get down into it and you know they can do the 15 minutes again completely. That's completely okay. That's what it's for. Say like, slow down, speed up. Actually, I'd like this character done this way. Or can you put more emphasis on here or, you know, more pauses between each paragraph? Just get really nitpicky on that 15 minutes because that's your chance to give direction. Mm. And then the narrator will go away and produce the book and they're not really obliged to come back to you and say, you know, how do you want each bit? A lot will, and I think a good narrator will come back and say, you know, and ask questions and say, what do you think about this? And if there's kind of a, you know, a strange moment in the book, they'll come back and say, hey, how do you want me to deliver this? Or, you know, and that's great. And as, as a narrator, when the author's receptive to that, rather than just be like, hey, where's my finished book? But like, to answer my questions and to help me out, then I'll, and then also, when you come back afterwards, and, you know, if you've been really helpful and kind of guiding throughout, and then, because you do get, obviously, when the book's done, you can say, go back and correct this and correct that. Then I'm going to be, you know, it's going to be a much, it's a better working relationship if there's a bit of to and fro. I don't think the narrator is just someone who you hand off a project to and expect it to come back perfectly done because there is creative license there. Mm. 